So, okay, I think we're ready to get started because we have so much to talk about. I'm Diane Blazik with All America Selections and National Garden Bureau. So I will be moderating today and I'm gonna be learning right along with everybody else. I also have Gail Pabst in my office. She's making everything work sufficiently um, or efficiently behind the scenes and that's great. Um, I will go through our three panelists and then let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about, more about their companies. So let's start with, I'm looking at my screen and on my screen, um, Laura Robles <laughs> is at the top, Laura with Walter Gardens. Then we have Zoltan Kovacs with Duman Orange and Darren Barshaw with Darwin Perennials. So Laura, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I am a regional product manager for Walters Gardens. Um, so I am basically responsible for making sure that we have a good relationship with all of our customers um, in my region, which is the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast. So anything I can do to support customers in that region. Um, so I get to travel to that part of the country a lot and visit garden centers and nurseries um, and talk about plants and share new plants. Um, and I love perennials. So it's the perfect job for me. Excellent. Uh, Zoltan, you next. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, my name is Zoltan Kovac. I'm the perennial product manager for North America and Canada for Duman Orange. I actually started the perennial program with Duman in 2013, I'm still with the company 10 years, and we have a extensive perennial offering and a lot of new varieties every year for introductions. And of course, we <clears throat> pay attention to garden performance so consumer can enjoy longer flowering, better performance and whatnot. Thank you. Excellent. And Darren? Hi, last I'm Darren. Last but not least. Oh, yeah, <laughs> last but not least. Good, good afternoon. Darren Barshaw with Darwin Perennials. Uh, we're based out of West Chicago, Illinois. We're a breeding company. We have a farm in uh, Columbia, Bogota, Columbia, actually, where we keep all of our stock for our plants as long as we have a good partnership with Walters Gardens, Laura's uh, company that we do a lot of business with as well. So we do a lot of breeding around the world, and we, we do similar to what, to what Laura does. I'm a product rep, so I travel around the country. Uh, with sales reps and customers, making sure they're they're using the, the the right perennials, the right perennial input, the timing is correct, anything they need, culture, all those good things. And I love perennials. I've been in the business for 40 years. Hate to say that, but it's been a long time. Um, I don't feel like it. Anyhow, we're looking forward to having some fun today. Thank you. Excellent. We will have some fun. And speaking of fun and travel. Um, I know Gail and I are going to be traveling out to California to the California Spring Trials, where we will see some of these even newer products. So the ones that we are going to be talking about today, as I roll into that, are the new varieties that your companies introduced like a year ago. Um, so you were introducing them to the commercial markets, which now they are available to consumers. So that's how I thought we would start today's presentation with some pretty pictures, which is always inspiring, um, makes me want to get outside and dig in the dirt. So this time, Darren, we are going to, um, wow, your name almost matches your company name. Um, Darren, from, <laughs> Darren from Darwin. Darren I, from I Darwin, would, yeah. That would be a tongue twister. Yeah. Um, so we're going to let you start. And as you go through these, um, you know, just talk about some of the new features for each one of these new varieties. And then after you finish, we'll go on to Duman and then to Walters. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Yeah, we introduced the uh, Bud Leia Chrysalis series. There's actually five colors. You got blue, pink, white, purple, and the blue and uh, cranberry. So we're highlighting the blue there. What we like about this introduction, and um, this is going into its second year, so you should be able to find this easily at, at your local garden centers. It's a pollinator magnet, of course. It's a butterfly butterfly bush, so it's a dwarf. It's in that 20 to 28 inch range, vase shaped. Very free flowering, smaller flowers, but many of them, and they cover themselves up. I like to say they cover their dead. So it's a very clean looking plant as it continues to flower all summer. Very disease resistant, especially downy mildew, which can be an issue on Butleas. Um, really carefree, it's zone five root hardy. So it's it's hardier than most other Butleas on the market, which is really important. So this can be 
almost the front of the border to a mid border plant. And uh, it also works in containers and will flower all season long in a container. And we do have a few customers that have trialed it in a hanging basket for a new concept as well. So a big 12 inch hanging basket on your deck would be fantastic with this Budlea Chrysalis series. More colors to come down the pipeline, but right now we have the five. Excellent, next up. Okay, Delphinium Red Lark. We introduced this last year. So this is was a big hit. This picture here, I believe, was at cast last year because we put together a big uh, combination into a barrel. But this red um, crimp, well, I want to say it's a, a kind of an orangey red, not really a Coke can red. Delphinium, there's not any other ones like this on the market. So it's, it's actually a hybrid. And what that means, it's going to flower more. It's not going to produce seeds, so it's sterile. It's not going to seed around, and it's going to last for years in your garden, unlike other delphiniums that are considered a biannual or they'll reseed around. Um, just a real showstopper. The spikes will get. The plant overall will probably be in that 30 to 36 inch range. Uh, the more highlight you have, the more red you're going to have. If you have some more shade or dappled shade, you're going to kind of get more pink tones in it. This is a superb plant. You'll see this at garden centers across America this spring and summer. So look for Delphinium red lark. Next one is Echinacea sombrero <clears throat> poco. So we have the sombrero series, which is about a dozen colors, which is a little bit larger Echinacea. This we introduced a couple of years ago. So this is poco, which is about a 12 to 14 inch Echinacea, free flowering. This will flower all summer long. Another one that works great in containers as well. I have a colleague of mine that planted a container, sat it on his patio all summer long. It bloomed until frost. Had butterflies and all your pollinators all over it. Uh, the flowers clean themselves up really well. There's five colors. So you got a yellow, a hot coral, a red, a white, and a rose. And those work really good as a mixture. If somebody wanted to do a combination pot of these, they, they time out really well. So if you're doing a mix for maybe your fall season instead of mums, this is a great alternative. And the white is probably my favorite because it's a really, really clear clear white, not a dull white at all, or ivory, it's just a pure white and it holds up really well. It's a fantastic little series here called Coco. And then uh, Artisan Echinacea is from our seed um, partnership people that we work with, which is Pan Am or Keef Seed. And this one is an All-American winner, a regional All-American winner. That means it, it tested really well in gardens across the region. This one's from Seed. Um, a lot of the seed, older seed varieties were inconsistent and not really uniform and looked kind of a little bit shoddy in the garden, unless you had like a cottage garden or English garden looks. But this artisan yellow ombre is just a superb color. You're in that 20 to 24 inch range for height. And this will, this will flower continuously through fall as well. And then Salvia uh, Blue Bayou. This is an All-American winner as well. This was just announced in July. So this is an AS winner across the nation. So north, south, east, to west, this plant is fantastic. Just think of Salvia May Night, which you've had in the garden for years. And I like to replace it with Salvia Blue Bayou. This would be May Night on steroids, May, right, May Night with more muscle power, flower power. It doesn't lodge apart. It'll reflush four or five times throughout the summer. Great color. It's in that 22 to 24 inch range. It blooms earlier than May night or even April night. And you can time this out. For, so you your, go to the garden centers and you can have the spring, summer, and fall. So Selvia Blue Bayou. Thank you so much, Darren. One question came in and yeah. I can answer it in part. Um, somebody asked how long these plants are trialed before they're brought onto the market. And um, you saw two AAS winners in here. They were both in our perennial trial. So AAS trials for three summers and three winters before we determine whether or not it is an AAS winner. Um, so Darren, and then we'll go on to Lauren Zoltan. Um, on average, how long are you trialing these varieties before you introduce them? Um. Three on average, it's about, it's about three years on average for us, maybe three to five. It depends. There's some things that we look at. And if we say, hey, it was a might have been a mild year and it overwintered and we think it might not be as hardy as it is, we'll reevaluate. But in most cases, it's three to five years for what we're looking at. Yeah, same for us. Same as uh, Darren says, it's three to five years, depending on the season varieties and, of course, species as well. So, right. yes. <clears throat> 
Yeah, for Walters, uh, we're also a minimum of three to four years, but there are actually some varieties um, that we trial even for up to 10 or more years, mainly because that's how long it takes to bring the variety to market. So we continue to trial and gather information during that time, but at least three to four years. Perfect. Uh, one quick question on Blue Bayou. Do you have to deadhead it to see the reblooming? You don't have to. It will reflush. Um, even when it's out of bloom, the calyxes are really dark, so you'll, it shows up along the landscape. And if you reflush, it's going to give you. If you trim it back, it'll give you a better reflush, but you don't have to, and it won't and it won't lodge apart. So it's a, it's a spectacular plant. Okay. Next up, Zoltan, we'll let you take over. Yeah, thank you, Diane. <clears throat> so Agastache better boss. What we feel on the market, we did not see any really compact Agastaches. So this is a series which is very compact and actually flowers under short days as well as long days. That means even for Southern growers, even in Florida or Southern customers, they can enjoy the flowers from early on. They were in flower in fe uh, February in Florida already and they flower to the whole summer. <clears throat> they stay very compact in the landscape. So I'm talking about probably the maximum height is 12 to 14 inches in the landscape. And pot production, obviously, is, it's shorter. Mm -hmm. We have three colors, but actually the right-hand side rose that we just took out, but we added the color, we added the purple color. So this better bus series is basically a really good summer <clears throat> flowering perennial. You know, hummingbirds, bees, butterflies really love this plant because of the nectar they provide. And we actually breed for that. So more of the pollinator friendly uh, breeding we do in some of these, uh, some of these uh, genuses. Spintop gallardia, <clears throat> this is pretty much right now the leading series in the entire country. And the reason why is because the plants are zone three hardy and they perform in zone nine B as well. So plants are actually trialed. All our plants are trialed. So people in the north, they like to hear this. North of Winnipeg, 67 miles. North of Winnipeg in Portage La Prairie, which is a solid zone three. It gets about uh, 39 to 40 below zero. <clears throat> in some cases with no snow cover. These gallardias, the spin tops, are the entire series is hardy to zone three and will perform also in Florida in the southern regions as well. They take the heat and humidity very well in the garden. You don't need to deadhead them. And compared to seed varieties, these will not set seed until very late. And the new flowers always cover up the seed pots, which is usually not so attractive. Not so attractive. So these are staying in a mounding shape and never open up in a garden. So it's a really great front item for gardens. Ibris White Shadow, we introduced last year. <clears throat> and uh, the great thing about this is late. So a lot of regions, the Ibris is flowering too early in the garden and people still too cold outside. People can't enjoy Ibris as they should be. It's a pure white Ibris. It's probably one of the largest flowers on the market right now. I have eight of them in my garden. It's still really nice and compact mounding. I don't think it's more than eight inches tall in my, six to eight inches tall in my garden, super large flowers. And it flowers around three weeks later than regular ibis in the garden. So I can enjoy it in end of April, May in Connecticut. <clears throat> so it's something we breed for later varieties because some of these very early spring items like ibis will flower too early for uh, consumers. Sweet Daisy Birdie, this is an AS winner, and this is not the best picture because actually the petals will hang down a little bit and looks like an egg yolk on top. This plant actually flowers in the garden 14 to 18 weeks. So this is one of the longest flowering lucantum on the market right now. It's not a small plant like you, look, you see it in the pot. It's actually, <clears throat> actually gets in the garden about 18 to 24 inch tall. And as I mentioned, flowers 14 to 18 weeks. And it's a beautiful display. It's sort of like a shorter Becky with a lot more interesting flowers and phenomenal landscape performance. Also zone three hardy and will flower even in the Southern regions because it's a first year flowering perennial. So it doesn't really need cold treatment to flower some other Lucantamons. Panstamon Pristine. <clears throat> this series is actually a semi-compact series. Panstamon I can see something like like Delphinium. If the plants in flower, everybody is really attracted to, to the plants. These are zone five hardy, solid zone five hardy. And we have like eight or nine colors in the series now. And as you can see, compared to the old uh, Penstemon, 
This branching better, you give, it gives you a lot more flowers and also a lot better performance, mm -hmm. stay a lot more compact as, you know, it doesn't get uh, 36 inch tall, it maybe gets 18 to 24 inch tall in a garden. It's superior branching, so you can enjoy the colors actually in the garden for a lot longer. <clears throat> Pioske Helena is actually one of the big highlights from last year because it's a pot picture, but actually in the garden, it's a mounding pirovskia. It's a, it's a first pirovskia, which is not an upright V-shaped pirovskia. It's mounding in the garden. It flowers very, very early. Even down south, like Florida, they were in flower end of January and they never stopped flowering through the whole summer. So this is an all season flowering pirovskia with a mounding habit, stay compact, Jerry Pirovsky, when it starts flowering, start open up also. This one, because of the mounding habit, it really stays really nice and mounding and doesn't open up and will give you color for entire summer. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Zoltan. And next we are going to Laura. Thank you. Um, so first, before I jump into the varieties, I just want to explain for anybody watching the presentation, um, if you don't know what the uh, relationship is between Walters Gardens and Proven Winners, since the first variety on here clearly has the Proven Winners logo on it. Um, so about 11 years ago, we entered a partnership with Proven Winners. So we are the perennial partner for the branded program, um, and we supply the majority of the perennial genetics for them. So um, at Walters Gardens, we offer both Proven Winners perennials, and then we also offer um, some items that are uh, not in that brand that can um, that are just in normal containers or not in the Proven Winners branded container. Um, but the first of the varieties that I'm going to talk about is a Proven Winners variety. So this is a brand new Agastache that is called Queen Nectarine. Um, so this is a new series that we introduced into the brand into the Proven Winners program. Um, the series name is called Meant to Be, B-E-E, -E, kind of a little play on words there because we're not all sick of the bee puns yet. Um, but as the name references, this is obviously a great pollinator magnet. Uh, the bees love these plants. Um, compared to some of the other Agastache, including some of the ones that we have in our catalog previous to these, um, the new Meant to Bees are much taller in the garden. So a lot of the breeding work that has been done, including at Walters Gardens in recent years, has been to produce uh, plants that have tended to be a little bit more compact. Um, but our breeding team and our lead breeder, Hans Hansen, wanted to make sure that we also have some nice tall garden height plants to offer. Um, so the Queen Nectarine and its uh, sister plant, Royal Raspberry, which is a nice bright raspberry color with a kind of a bronzy tinge on the foliage, those two are going to be up in the 24 to 32 inch or so height in the garden. So much taller Agastache uh, with good proportionate flowers, kind of the top half to two thirds of the plant is flowers. Uh, once they start blooming, um, kind of in early to midsummer, they basically just keep going, um, kind of a nonstop flowering machine. Uh, the next is a new Echinacea. So we've had um, single flowered echinacea that have come out of our breeding program for a number of years. And then this past year, we actually did our first launches on double flowered echinacea. Um, so this is one of the first two colors that went into the Proven Winners series called Double Coated. Um, so we've had the color coded series, which are the single flowers, and then the double coated series are the double flowers. Um, so Raspberry Beret has really nice, large kind of four inch diameter flowers on plants that are a little bit shorter and wider. So they're more 18 to 20 inches in height and then form a nice kind of low wide habit. Um, lots of flowers, lots of basal branching that leads to lots of flowers. Um, and a lot of people may wonder on these doubles, um, the double echinacea um, do not tend to attract pollinators as, re as regularly or as consistently as the single flowered echinacea, uh, but they definitely still have their place in the garden. They're beautiful, um, long blooming plants with this nice large flower on it. Uh, and the other color that goes with this one is called butter pecan and is kind of a light, um, a light kind of creamy, buttery yellow, almost a melon um, color. I just saw a, a mention pop up in the chat room about zone hardiness. So the echinacea um, that you see here, these are going to be hardy from zone four to eight. 
And did you mention on the Agastashi? Uh, the Agastashi will also be, um, those are going to be five to nine. So okay. this, these particular Agastashi, we've done a lot of trialing um, with another proven winners partner that is located in New Hampshire. And we have good um, three to four years of overwintering trial data from there. And we are listing these as hardy to zone five. Thank you. Um, next is a brand new Hucarella called Copper King. Um, so this one is not in the Proven Winners brand, which is why you only see the Walters Gardens logo on the slide here. Uh, but this is a new Hucarella. So Hucarella, for anybody who isn't familiar with that, is actually an intergeneric cross between Hucarella and Tiarella. Um, so both of these are kind of shade to moderate shade varieties. Um, but what the what the Tiarella brings to this interspecific cross is that you get these very kind of dissected foliage, almost more of like a maple leaf look to it than you would on most um, pure heuchera. You also get much more of that dark vein color in the center. Um, so this Copper King has that really nice, rich kind of burgundy purple veining on the interior of the foliage. Um, and then the exterior part of the foliage, depending on the time of year, ranges from kind of a chartreuse green um, during kind of the fall, early spring, over winter months. And then when you get the new flush of foliage, you get that really nice kind of orange and coppery tones on it. So it's a really nice bright color when it's actively growing. Um, and then the other thing that Tiarella offers to this interspecific cross is that you get um, a more pronounced flower than you do with a heuchera. So this particular variety, Copper King, has a white flower but they're much more kind of bottle brush foamy. Um, the, the common name on TRL is foam flowers. So when you have the, the cross, they're actually called foamy bells. So instead of coral bells and foam flower, you have foamy bells is that interspecific cross or intergeneric cross. <clears throat> um, and these plants, um, without the flowers, they're fairly low to the ground, about 10 to 12 inch mounted uh, foliage. Um, and then with the flower scapes on them, you'll get up to about 20 inches. Um, and these are going to be hardy uh, in zones four to nine. Okay, sorry. Uh, the comment, does Copper King have fall color also? Sorry if you mentioned that. Yeah, um, throughout m part of the fall, you'll still retain kind of that coppery color. Once you get on into the colder parts of fall, um, it will take on more kind of a, the chartreuse hue or the, it'll, it'll be a little bit more subtle coloration when the temperature is cooler. Only when the leaves and the foliage is actively growing, you have the really bright colors. Um, next plant is one of my favorite new introductions. And as you can see on the slide here, this is actually the recent winner of the NGB's Green Thumb Award. Yay! Um, but this is, like I said, one of my favorite new introductions. I have a bunch of these in my yard and I absolutely love them. It's such a unique astilbe um, with the really dark, foliage. A lot of people actually think at first glance that this is a heuchera, uh, but it is truly an astilbe. Um, so when the new foliage first emerges, it is kind of a chartreuse color with a little rim of that nice dark purple black along the edges. And then as the, as the new leaves expand and mature, they become this fully overall. I really black, like that. Very pretty. I really um, like of, that. Kind of glossy foliage. Um, and then you, as you can see in the picture here, it does get a purple chinensis type flower spike. So the only other dark foliage um, astilbe that I'm aware of that's been on the market is one called Chocolate Shogun that has a white flower. Um, so this has a different look with the purple flower. It's also a very nice vigorous plant. So sometimes you get a plant where you think it looks really pretty, but then it just doesn't grow and perform well in the garden. Uh, but this dark side of the moon is definitely a performer. Um, in more northern regions in the garden, I would make sure that it gets more sun so it can definitely even take full sun as long as you're providing good moisture. Like with any other astilbe, you don't want to let them get too dry because if you do, the foliage will get crispy and it won't recover that year no matter really what you do until it regrows the next year. Uh, so make sure you supply adequate moisture. Um, in further southern regions, um, it would probably benefit from a little bit more shade cover, but where I am here in Michigan and in other parts of the, the north of the country, um, definitely give it full sun and it'll it'll reward you. Uh, beautiful plant. So this one is going to be hardy in zones four to nine 
Um, height of the foliage itself will get up to about 20 inches. And then when it is flowering, uh, those flowers will get on up to about three feet tall, even probably 30 to 36 inches tall. Um, it's not going to be quite as floriferous as some of the other astilbe that aren't the dark foliage, uh, but it still does get a good number of flowers. And then throughout the whole season, egg the not in flower, uh, just beautiful foliage. Um, and then we have a new hibiscus. This is in the Summerific series. Uh, this one's called Valentine's Crush. Um, so within the Summerific series, we have a couple of uh, different habits. And the crush part of the name indicates that it is a more kind of columnar habit. So a little bit taller and narrower habit compared to um, the rest of the series that don't have the crush in the name that are more mounted. So Valentine's Crush is a new one. It actually is replacing Cranberry Crush. So if any of you have those in your garden, um, this one is kind of the new upgraded version. And it's basically a little bit more columnar in habit than that. So it fits better in the Crush um, subseries. It is a brighter red flower. So a really nice bright flower. And then that darker eye stands out more against that bright red coloration. It's also a much flatter flower. So Cranberry Crush, um, you would get sometimes a little bit of a cupped forward angle to the petals. Um, but with hibiscus, we want to have a really nice, large, flat flower with nice overlapping petals. And so this one just has more of that flat presentation. Um, and then like with all of our summerific hibiscus breeding, um, just really nice habit, dense foliage, very high bud count um, and flowers basically from top to bottom of the, of the plant that kind of opens successively. So you get a nice long bloom time. Um, and the hibiscus are hardy in zones four to nine. And this particular variety will grow to about five feet tall and about uh, three and a half feet wide or so. So definitely taller than it is wide. Um, and then a new Monarda. So kind of like with the Agastache uh, that I mentioned earlier, this is another genus where our breeding team wanted to develop some varieties that had a nice tall garden height again to make sure that we weren't just focusing on short or intermediate stature plants. Um, so this is in a new series called the Upscale series. Um, and all of these are gonna be in that two and a half to three foot uh, final garden height range. Um, Red Velvet is the one that you see pictured here and is my particular favorite of the three. And then we also have one called Pink Chanel. Um, that's kind of a nice bright bubblegum medium pink and then one that's called lavender taffeta um, the red velvet i just really love the color on this um, the closest thing that i know of out there is jacob klein which is a an old variety of monarda that's been out for a long time but red velvet has a nicer habit uh, much more nicely stacked uh, plant and also is better uh, resistant to mildew so these are going to be nice tall plants in the garden but still with good mildew resistance, um, good flower coverage, and you do get a little bit of kind of a second flush so that you have a longer bloom time. Great, thank you. Um, we didn't get a chance to ask our first two panelists. Um, you guys might have mentioned zone hardiness, so I'm gonna go back up to the beginning. Um, Darren, if you don't mind, and just make a few comments on the zone hardiness. If you already said it, my apologies, but we will uh, kind of go back through these for um, Darren, for the Budlia. Sure, the Budlia is a zone five root hardy. That's okay. Zone five to nine. Delphinia would be a zone five to nine as well. And then somebody else commented in there on, on the chat too, as far as sun versus shade. These would all be sun items depending on you know, the deep south, like the delphinium is going to need some afternoon shade, probably even the echinacea. The pocos will be zone four to nine. All the all the colors, yep. Yeah. And the artisan will be a zone four to nine. And same as the salvia will be a zone four to nine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And same thing for you, Zoltan. Um, zone <laughs> and sun or shade? Zone six to nine, and it's full sun. Zone three to nine, full sun. <clears throat> Ivory zone four to zone eight B, uh, sun. Zone three to nine B, full sun. Penstemon zone five to nine, full sun. Pirovskia zone four to nine, full sun. 
All right. Okay. So looks like uh, something that everybody is always interested in. Um, anything that would be deer resistant. And while you guys talk about that, I'm going to quit sharing my screen. We're finished with the PowerPoint. And so then we can look at your lovely faces. And by the way, for everybody, if you want to put it on speaker view up in the upper right hand, um, then you can see the person who's actually speaking. So any comments on um, deer resistance versus deer food? <laughs> hmm. Boy. Um. It well, depends on your garden. My, uh, the deer in my neighborhood pretty much eat everything, um, unfortunately, except for, well, they even eat corvelles. But the echinaceas, they seem to avoid. Uh, the delphinium, they're probably going to munch those flower buds off. Um, you guys can comment on your plants as well. I'm not sure. Yeah, I would say of the ones I covered, um, probably the Monarda and the Agastache would be the least likely to be bothered by deer. Um, typically, perennials that have more of a scented mm -hmm. foliage, whether it's kind of the minty family ones or like an allium, the ornamental onions, those tend to not be bothered as much. Um, hibiscus, I don't usually see deer eating them, but I wouldn't say that they're 100% deer proof. I wouldn't call anything 100% deer proof, especially right. depending on where you live, but. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. for us, uh, the Pirovsky is definitely because it has a scent to it, an ag statue, as Laura mentioned. I see that, I see that Goladi also in very heavy, populated deer areas, some get bothered, some not. So it's, 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 it's a 50-50 chance. And penstemon is definitely uh, dear likes the penstemon and delphinium, that type of sweeter lush foliage. And generally, actually, salvias, some of the salvias with a little bit more brittle foliage, uh, larger foliage does not get eaten by deer, but it's also region dependent, how, how, how hungry they are. Right. Exactly. Um, somebody has asked if they will be at Cultivate or the Philadelphia Flower Show this year. Um, I'm going to make a statement. I assume they were at Cultivate last year, since most of these were last year's introductions. Um, yeah. You have to make way for what, for you, that you're introducing in 23, um, that will be available in garden centers in 24. Those will be the ones. So got to if you're going to go to Cultivate, you'll see even more new things, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, and sometimes we... I was just going to say, sometimes we'll put varieties that have been out a little bit longer, especially if they're part of another display, um, like a plant of the year display or something at Cultivate. But I would say the best places to see these would be if there's like local garden shows happening. A lot of times we'll have um, folks that we partner with to put our plants in those. So like locally here in Michigan, there's the Michigan Home and Garden Show coming up and we do those at various places throughout the country. I think some of these would be at the Philadelphia Flower Show as well. And I have to mention the NGB website. Um, this is where we work with all the breeders, like the three on our panel, and you guys submit your new varieties and that's what goes into our website under the new plants program. So if you're wanting to find out anything more about these and other new varieties mm -hmm. that we have, that would be a good place to go. Um, another question that we had here is, are these new varieties cultivars and hybrids? Um, so I'm assuming the answer there is yes. So they're cultivated varieties of native plants that have been out there and this is how you're doing your breeding work, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. And now one of the questions was about producing more nectar. And I think the best way to address that is I'm not, I've never seen anybody out in the fields, but maybe I just haven't seen it, you know, as far as actually measuring nectar. But I think one of the key components is the number of flowers and the bloom time. Right. Um, so I think I heard pretty much every single one of you when it was a flowering plant say, hey, this has more flowers, it's better branching, it's basal branching. So the more branches, the more flowers. So that really is the way that we are talking to the pollinators and saying, hey, we have more um, flowers for you. So anybody want to comment on yeah. that? Yeah, more. I think more flowers and uh, more longer lasting flowers. So then you have potentially have more pollen, more nectar in these newer varieties as well. Uh, 
Okay. Um, oh, and somebody made a comment about Mount Cuba doing yeah. a study of echinacea and pollinators, and they did. And I literally, mm -hmm. um, from Darwin, we have the uh, Sombrero Baja Burgundy is one of the AAS winners. And that one was number six of, I don't know, 20, 30 varieties right. that Mount Cuba had trialed. And it was number six for attracting pollinators. So that goes to show that, you know, these echinacea that are blooming longer, they do provide more food for the pollinators. Is there anything else that you guys want to comment on in regards to new breeding work? I see a question about sterile plants. Um, and I actually was gonna ask that about the Budlia. Mm -hmm. um, in certain instances, you do want to have sterile plants um, in case in some areas it's considered invasive. So maybe if each one of you wants to talk a little bit about that, which plants you're trying to breed for sterility. Yeah, I could say our the Budlia chrysalis that we introduced, uh, we have not had it tested for sterility, but we've been watching it for probably about five years and have not seen any seedlings developed in all of our trial spots across the country, across North America, really. So um, we're pretty confident that it's not, or the seed is not viable, um, but breeding work wise, I think a lot of the product that we're bringing to, to the, to the uh, consumer out to the marketplace is not producing seed as much. We want to have more flower power and longer longer life and, and more vigor into the plant. So you get, you know, your money's worth that that plant lasts for years and years is what we're looking at. Not having a bunch of seedlings fall around and kind of dirtying things up. That's kind of our goal. I'm sure it's all of our goal. Yeah, same with us at Walters. Um, there's not really anything that we've tested to be certified sterile, including the Budlia, but we do, um, look at seedling production and select for varieties that we see little to no seed set on. Um, and yeah, the majority of our hybrid cultivars, um, I would say are either sterile or set so little seed that you're not going to have any issue with seedlings. Yeah, I think it's every breeders, you know, breeders wish to be all sterile plants, but it's, it takes years and years mm -hmm. to add, for example, you guys know like the Big Bang, Little Bang series of uh, Coriopsis, the breeder will not release anything which is not sterile. So it's actually, it's his security so people can breed with it because it doesn't even produce pollen. But yeah, we, we try to do the same thing at Boom and Orange. You know, plants tend to have seedlings all around. We, we discard those selections and either it's not sterile, you can't say it until it really is proven, but if the seeds are not viable, as Darren said, then, then it's close to the sterile as possible. Okay, well, let's talk about in the garden. Um, it's almost spring, kind of spring in some areas. I think, Sultan, you're down in Florida, so it's already summer temperatures. <laughs> um, but let's talk about spring emergence with perennials. Um, which ones are hard to identify? Which ones are easy to identify? Is there, do you really need to identify them? Should you be out there babying them? Should you just let them go? Let, let's, let's talk about what to do or not do in the spring garden when it comes to perennials. Well, Diane, <clears throat> it depends what the plant is. If it's a fully mm -hmm. dormant plant, like a steel bee lower has, that's a really nice one, that's dark side of the moon. That plant will emerge itself. It doesn't need to be any cleaning. But if it's an evergreen plant, for example, our iberis, I just looked at them a few days ago in my garden. They actually stayed really nice evergreen. You're not going to have too much. Sometimes you can clean them up a little bit, like sometimes old branching and all that stuff to clip them up quick. But it's not much to do with these plants, actually, <clears throat> because dormant plants will emerge and and generally evergreen plants stay pretty clean and they will also flush out. So, I mean, a good garden cleaning is always a, a must, <clears throat> nice raking and mulching and whatnot, but I don't see a whole lot of maintenance. No, I agree. I always walk the gardens right now. I'm in Michigan, so I got hellebore, early hellebores are blooming. They're blooming through the snow. So I took some pretty cool pictures of that too, but we had snow and ice as Laura <laughs> knows. It's been pretty nasty here, but the sun's shining today. Um, but like Zoltan said, I usually walk the gardens. There's a few things that'll emerge early, like, you know, uh, Mertensia, Virginia bluebell, some of those things. I just make sure that the, if, usually you see them start emerging. They're pushing, if there's any leaves or anything, or they're, they're pushing them up. I maybe clean that away a little bit and then let them go. And if, you know, like Zoltan said, something evergreen, 
as it starts emerging, you see some dead branching, clean it up. Otherwise, they're they're pretty pretty low maintenance. Yep, I would agree with what both of them said. Um, only things I would add to that, I do the same thing. I walk my garden pretty consistently once we even have a chance of seeing anything start to emerge just because it's part of the ritual of spring to see mm -hmm. what's coming up out there and what's bigger and what's did well and what didn't. Uh, for me, even though I live in an area that has a lot of rabbit population, I'm a hosta collector. And so as soon as I see my hostas coming up, I start spraying them with rabbit repellent because we all know that hostas are food for deer and rabbits, but I choose to still fight that battle because mm -hmm. I like the hostas. So um, that's one thing that I'll do. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that there are some perennials that come up pretty late. Um, and we have some examples of those at Walter's. So hibiscus is one of those. Um, Asclepia, the butterfly weed is one of those. Um, we do some breeding work with um, zone 5B or 6 hardy uh, lagerstomia, which is a crepe myrtle, kind of a dwarf version for the north. Um, those are not another one that come up late, Budlia. There's there's various ones. And I think the main thing with those is to make sure that you um, know where you've planted them so that you don't forget and think that they're not coming up because a lot of times it's it's really quite late in the season before some of those come up. Um, I personally like to leave stems up on stuff like hibiscus. Um, it's also something that takes a while to go down in the winter uh, to where the stems fully go from green to brown, and you know that all that energy has gone down into the crown and the roots of the plant. Um, so if you leave the stems up, A, you get more of that energy down, uh, B, you know where the plant is in the spring, um, and it just also provides you with some winter interest. So that's another thing to just kind of keep in mind is anything that's coming up late. Yeah, actually, you... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Laura, I wanted to say I always leave the hibiscus sticks up because it looks really cool with the ice and the snow. And you know where they are coming up. And also ornamental grasses, maybe that's something. If it's not ever the ornamental grass, generally I don't cut it until the spring. And it looks really nice with the snow on it. And of course, when the spring comes, then the, you know, the brown grass, you can cut them all the way down pretty much and then restart the whole process. Be patient is my, my word of wisdom. Don't yep. give up. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking too. Is is to be patient. Don't don't jump to conclusions that something hasn't survived because all of a sudden it'll it'll pop up. But uh, I, I, it makes me think of the importance of your plant tags and putting a plant tag in the ground or keeping a good journal and mapping out your garden and keeping track of what you planted where. Um, just you might think you have a a blank spot, but all of a sudden here's this hibiscus and you will be. Well, actually, Diane, I have to comment one more thing. For example, a Gallardia spin tops in a warmer region than ever, they are evergreen. But when you look at zone three, for example, when we do the zone three hardness, we also do for three years, they go completely dormant. So there's nothing like that plants and they suddenly they just push out and they're really beautiful and get bigger and bigger every year. So you have to be careful because some of the semi evergreen perennials in the colder regions, I'm talking about zone four, five, uh, sometimes five, eight, four, three, they will go completely dormant, but the plants are still alive. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see here. I think you touched on spring cleaning. Um, what I was hearing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is don't really need to do a lot. Maybe you want to pull away some of the mulch or, or deadlies from some of them. But is there any other thoughts on spring cleaning of your perennial bed? I personally probably do more spring cleaning than I do fall cleaning. Just because, like I mentioned with the hibiscus or, or Zoltan mentioned, same with the ornamental grass, there's various things that I do like to leave up for the fall, for the winter interest. Um, if I look out in my landscape right now, which I'm not at home, but I mean, I can see my hibiscus up, my buddleia up, my grass is up. Um, I'm trying to think what else I leave I up, can, hellebores. Can, you don't, echinacea up too. Yeah, the, the echinacea the for the yeah. for the finches. Yeah, right. I mean, there's a number of things. Really, the only things I really make sure to clean up in the fall 
our pastas because anything where like the foliage just goes completely down and flat and it's not going to give you any winter interest, you may as well clean up in the fall. But things that are more structural or that serve the purpose of feeding the birds like the echinacea or even things like the ornamental grasses or other things that have hollow stems, sometimes bees will overwinter inside of those. So um, for me, I kind of do like a half and half split of what I'm cleaning in fall versus spring. I would agree. Excellent. Um, what about fertilizing? Uh, do you recommend fertilizing the perennials at a certain time? Um, how early or late would you uh, do the first fertilization? Well, I think Diane, depends on the region. Mm -hmm. If you look at Northeast Midwest, we generally start perennials. I just buy a few bags of fertilizer. I use Osmocote on my garden. And I use like 20, 20, 20 or something like 20, 18, uh, 20, something like a mom feed or petunia feed. I put a handful on each around the plants. Try not to put on the crown of the plants because you can burn the plants. I did that last year. Put on my azaleas and I forgot to wash them and it got leaf burn on them. But depends on the region. When the spring is emerging, it's a good time to do it. And usually I use eight to nine month fertilizer. <clears throat> so I don't have to do it again. Some people do it in the summertime, like in June, one more time. I generally don't do it, but yeah. Yep, I would I would agree with Sultan. Yep. And I want to point out that even the experts make mistakes sometimes, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> that's how we that's how we learn, I hope. Exactly. Yeah. Thank I, you yeah. for admitting that. Diane, I always say, you know, I killed millions of plants. That's how we become better, right? Right. You, can be, you cannot be a grower if you didn't kill millions of plants before. I yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah, you definitely learn by experience. Um, That's what makes gardening fun, too, because otherwise we'd all run out of space if we never killed off any of our plants. <laughs> right. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Have to take over the neighbor's yard. Yeah. yeah. Um, and a, a question here about echinacea. Well, there was two questions about echinacea. One was, I've had difficulty with echinacea wintering over. Um, and I asked the gentleman, uh, which zone? I don't, I don't see that answer. But also the question about echinacea reverting to the purple. So I'm wondering if anybody has any tips there. Boy, overwintering, it de probably depends on the, the soil conditions. If they're in a, a moist soil uh, or low spot, they're not going to overwinter. Those crowns are going to rot out. And if they didn't plant them early enough in the fall, depending on when they plant them, if they plant them, depending on the region, you really need to have them planted by, for us up here, you know, I like to say first of September, middle of August, really to get your plants in the ground and let them have time to really get established so they do overwinter well. And I wouldn't uh, do a fall fertilization at all on anything because you're just going to push a lot of nitrogen. And sometimes that will also cause all that green growth. And then you'll get dieback of the total plant, possibly when you get your first or second hard frost. Uh, as far as reversion, I think back in the days when, to, when we started doing tissue culture propagation on echinaceas, there was some what I want to call drift back to the old varieties. But I don't see that in any of these newer genetics, at least what, I, what I've what i observed in the gardens, not just our varieties, but even Walter's or, or Zoltan's varieties, I, I don't see that happening. So I think that has been fixed as far as I know. I don't know if you guys have seen that at all lately. Only on Big Sky series, the old Big Skies, which were the first colors sure. in the yep. year, yep. like 15 years ago or 20 sure. years ago, maybe. That's the only reason I get the customers and Friends says, hey, this river is back to pink or purple yeah. or something. But the new generation of what you guys are doing, echinaceas, is like uh, Volters and Darwin, they're phenomenal plants. You can't do any better echinaceas. Right. So one Yeah, I think some of the older ones too, if um, I, I agree that like the newer genetics, I think are fabulous, not going to be likely to see that happen. Some of the older ones too, if it's not reverting, you can see seed set. And when you go back to the seed set, usually you'll get the original, you know, colors of either like the pinks, purples, or whites that come up in your garden. Yeah, I, I think Laura also, because the big sky, for example, was a first generation. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of reversion. And these guys, these echinaceas, what you guys are showing is about like 10 more generation already yeah. passed. So if you're yeah. not, you're not as easily back. Yeah, exactly. 
buy some new, buy some new of these, some of these new varieties, take the old ones out that you're seeing fade, fade and test that theory. Yep. Right, right. I've heard stories about uh, African violets, how people like to keep their African violets for years and years and years, even though they don't bloom anymore. And so, you know, or the poinsettias, it's like, really, do we really want to try to make them bloom again? You know, there is a reason why these newer things are on the market. They're replacing the things that are not quite as, um, as good. Um, one of the things that we did not talk about, and I did not choose the three of you simply because you're all, um, non seed breeders so you can can you talk about seed breeding versus tissue culture versus vegetative cuttings and and the differences so basically all the varieties we talked about today are not available from seed it's not like you can order a seed packet or anything these are available as plants only um, but if somebody wants to uh, talk about that a little bit yeah the artisan series that I commented on that ombre orange is the only variety that that I talked about that is from seed. All of our seed breeding is done by our branch of the company called Keef Seed or Pan Am Seed. So they they do all their breeding work differently than tissue culture breeding work or vegetative, but I'm I'm not a breeder, so I'm not gonna speak very, very much on that at all, because I'll get lost. I just look at the plants and say, yeah, we need to bring that to market or we need to change this or do this. And they work their magic. Yeah, all of the ones um, that I talked about today are also not from seed. Um, we do a little bit. The, um, the main one I can think of that we do from seed is our hellebore. So we have a couple of series, um, wedding party and honeymoon, um, that are um, from seed. Um, but even then, we're moving towards working on developing some TC hellebore varieties. Um, yeah, typically with... I, I don't want to speak a lot to seed versus veg or TC either, but I mean, typically a lot of the varieties we go towards having them in that method instead, just because of trueness of the plants and stuff like that, that you can get um, and some different traits or um, characteristics that come with the vegetative breeding versus seed breeding. So right. yeah, TC, you're going to be, like you said, more consistent color, you're not going to get the drift, consistent characteristics where a seed item, you can be, you know, you're going to be up and down um, as far as consistency. I mean, seed has definitely gotten better. Again, like Zoltan mentioned, generation after generation of breeding, it's definitely getting better items from seed or there's some pretty spectacular things coming out. But TC is kind of superior as far as cleanliness and disease and all of that, that we can really uh, keep a handle on. Okay, we have a question here about Aster's yellow on an echinacea. Does anybody want to address that? Like what to do? It's, it's transferred by leaf hoppers. Um, it's not a whole lot you can do, I don't think, to prevent it. It's just, I think it's really seasonality. It depends on the year. Sometimes it's worse than others. You can cut the blooms off um, and let it reflush, you know, cut the bat, the ones that have the Aster's yellow and let it reflush, but it's not going to. It's typically not going to move around to other, you know, that plant's not going to spread it to another plant. It's going to be that leaf hopper jumping around. And I've seen it on more than just echinaceas and, you know, in my gardening years, but there's really no preventative besides going out and spraying and nobody wants to do that because you're killing all the good stuff. So it's one of those things that you unfortunately have to deal with. Yeah. If I ever see it in my garden, I would rip the plant out. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like Darren said, that it won't spread from plant to plant on its own, but it is insect vectored. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'd I'd play it safe and just get rid of that plant. Replace it with a newer newer variety. There you go. Good excuse to replace it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so as we're coming down to our last few minutes, um, I have my own question for each of you, and I want to know what your favorite perennial gardening tip is for our audience. So each of one of you, if you can take a minute or so and um, tell us what your favorite perennial gardening tip is. I'll start out, I guess. Um, I don't know if it's a tip, but this is how I look at it. I, I, I say be patient, like I mentioned earlier, because I'm, I'm always, like Laura said, as soon as there's a chance of anything emerging, I'm out walking around. I already had some bulbs coming up and then we got snow and ice over them. So I can't see those now, but just be patient, watch for things to emerge, you know, as you see things coming up, 
you know, clean the clean like we mentioned a little bit in the spring, but also gardens evolve. You know, sometimes I get frustrated and say, oh, this plant got a little bigger than I ever thought it would be. You know, how many times I've moved plants in my garden and it's just part of doing it. So I just always, I guess, don't get frustrated. Just say that plant didn't do so well here. Let's move it over to here and give it another shot. That's kind of how I look at how I do gardening because I don't always put them in the right spot. I want it there. I want to see if it's going to work. <clears throat> if it doesn't, I'll move it later. So that's that's kind of how I look at it. Okay, patience is the key. Patience. Um, yeah. Okay, excellent. I'll have to remember that. Uh, who next, Laura or Zoltan? I'll go. Um, I think my um, favorite tip or tips would be mm -hmm. one to to keep experimenting with new things and different varieties, and and don't be scared of something just because it's maybe something you've never tried or maybe don't know or haven't heard of. Um, there's some really cool perennials out there that maybe aren't all that well known, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try it or fear it or think that you won't be successful. And maybe you won't be successful the first four times you plant it. And then the fifth time you try it, it'll be magical. Um, and then the other thing I would say is to make sure that you enjoy it. I mean, we're all busy. Every like spare light moment during the summer and spring, I'm sure these guys too, I'm out in my garden whenever I'm at home and have time to work in the garden. But then I also try to take time, like on a Sunday morning, I'll get up and I'll sit and have coffee on the deck and just enjoy it and enjoy the, the flowers and enjoy the birds flying around the garden and, you know, everything that comes with a garden. So make sure you take time to actually just be out there and, and have fun with it too. All right, Zoltan. Well, there's a couple of tips I can give you first is ladies be in charge of gardening. Just tell your husband what to do. <laughs> because that's what I do with my wife. She just I just show her all the new varieties and she picks what she wants to put in the garden. So I'm completely off the hook after I planted everything. And the second one is actually I love to replace plants because I get all these trial plants always and two, three years later, like, ah, okay, it was good. Sometimes I give it away to people, but... Uh, you know, enjoy gardening. Don't be afraid to rip out plants and replant. You know, you enjoy, you say, okay, you want something better or, or something different, a little bit taller, a little bit brighter, bigger flower. Don't be afraid to be, you know, ripping out plants. You know, plants are not so expensive. You can't do that. I'm pretty sure, you know, six, seven dollars, you can buy a plant or ten dollars. You replace four, five, six, ten plants a year. You know, it's not going to break the bank. And yeah, that's that's what I would advise. All right, I just captured all your tips in the chat. So, uh, and we'll be using them for social media as well. So I think we will wrap up for the day. I know we all have things to do at the hour. So this has been wonderful, um, very inspirational to see all those new varieties and love all your tips and advice. So thank you to our panelists, um, get out there and garden. Go, uh, go tend to your perennials and buy the ones that you need to replace. And with that, we will say so long and have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.